Good afternoon. Today is June 30th, halfway through 2021, and it's a great pleasure today to have Professor Nina Smith with me. Uh, Nina is a professor, longtime professor of economics at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, and I've known her for, I think, probably almost 30 years now, which dates both of us. And in addition to that, and this is the reason I especially want to talk to her today, she has been heavily involved outside academe in Denmark. She was, I believe, at one point, essentially the head of the Council of Economic Advisors of the Danish government. She currently chairs a new commission overhauling the entire welfare system of Denmark. And especially important for our purposes, she is currently the chairman of the board of directors of a major finance company in Denmark, deputy chair of the subcompany, which is the operating company. And so she has much, I believe, than almost any other academic I have ever met. And for that reason, Nina, it's a great pleasure to have you on here today. Here today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks a lot for having me. What I want to do is talk about some issues on gender equality. And the first one is completely standard. What causes the gender pay gap, in your view? Yeah. You have all the usual suspects, I start to say. Um, you have, uh, in the was very much about discrimination, classical speaker discrimination, where there were simply employers or colleagues who didn't like women and then they were paid lower. But I, I think the research nowadays are saying that this is not what it is about. Uh, if there's discrimination, it's much much more sophisticated. I'll come back to that. But maybe it is in some first instance Central and Eastern European countries where gender stereotypes and all that is much more pronounced than in the US and in Western European, Northern European countries. Then, of course, you have lack of human capital. I would also say it's not about that any longer. You know, today, today, Women do much better at uh, in the educational system. Uh, I think in uh, in the OECD countries, on average, sixty percent of the those who graduate from universities they are women. You may say they are not in the STEM education, and so that's of course an issue. But but the human capital investments uh, in women are larger than in men in general. So it's not about that. It's about the family. I would say to a large extent. Um, it's about women having babies, um, being out of the labor force, taking care of sick children, and all that old stuff. Uh, I mean, you almost get tired from, from seeing all these studies documenting impact of children, the mother penalty, and sometimes the father premium, because Men, they, I had a study some years ago where we looked at Danish men and, and they have a premium for having children, as it's found in many other countries, unless they take care of the children. Then they are punished also, just like women. So the problem is that it's women, to a large extent, who have all the household responsibilities. There's a study by, uh, it's actually based on Danish data, but it's published internationally and they're often cited uh, now by, um, by Cleven and uh, co-authors. And it says that in Denmark, it's based on registered data from Denmark. And Denmark was one of the first countries to have equal pay legislation and equal pay in collective agreements and all that. But when you look at the gender gap, it has, incre it has decreased the raw gap from the mid-80s. But then they try to, to split it in different reasons for the decline, and they find that human capital and all that uh, has explained the decline. But looking at the impact of family and children, uh, it is about, um, uh, it's, uh, almost the same effect on the gender gap as it was 40 years ago. Despite well, I think that's true, but look, I know that, but I do know in most Western countries, looking at time use data, men are doing more household work, women yeah. are doing somewhat less. Yeah. So, I mean, there should have been some change because of the changing nature of the intra-household bargain, but you say yeah, there isn't. Yes. 
You also know that when we look at these time use things, you see that men do a lot of weekend work. Uh, they clean the garden and they wash the car and so on, while women do all the time inflexible things like picking up the children from from kindergarten and all that. And that doesn't match very well with a good career because, I mean, for instance, in the Nordic countries, we pick up our children very early. We don't have nannies and all that as you have in the U.S. because it's too expensive. So in that sense, you still have a division of work where women take all the thing, all the time slots which are time fixed and where you have great conflicts with your career. While men, they also do a lot of cooking during the weekends, uh, if you can call this housework. I would say it's lesser time, but that's another thing. Um, so, so still, children matters a lot. And then, of course, you have to think that all these uh, maternity leave and parental leave schemes that we have got in most most countries, they are they are family friendly, but it, they are extremely gender biased. In my own country, there's only a quotation for the mother, and then there's a general parental leave, but no quotation for the fathers. And fathers don't pick up guide care if they can avoid to do it in most countries. So it's mother has 90% of the child care leave still. And therefore, you still have all these things. And then when the child care then increases, uh, that's, that's been the case for many countries. In Denmark, you have a child care leave period now for one year. Then it actually may have an unintended boomerang effect back on the women because being out of the labor force for almost one year, that's not really good. And yeah, so I would say, children and family, that's still really important. But then you have the next thing which has become more and more, uh, I think it started in sociology, these things about gender stereotypes. Uh, there was a paper by Schein, uh, early 70s, uh, with the title or, or the, the idea, think manager, think male, that you implicitly think that a successful manager should have all the masculine traits. And there are a lot of the research on this in, in business uh, literature and also psychology and sociology, but it has actually also now come to quarterly journal of economics and, and other high profile journals uh, in economics. Um, and I think that's quite interesting because sometimes you call it unconscious bias, that you implicitly think that when you see women, they won't do a career, even though they may want to do it. And this is not only about statistical discrimination, as statistical discrimination is rational. There you on average have that you are actually having the right expectations. Um, then of course, it's not very good for those women who actually want to have a career despite right. their children. But when you have gender stereotypes, you may exaggerate the, 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 uh, the impact of the family on women because, uh, I mean, the, the typical idea is that, oh, that's how women are. And then you, you, you exaggerate the impact of the family, just like you may say that all oh, those coming from Ireland, they are red haired and so on, despite the fraction is quite small. Uh, and that's, of course, a problem. On this. I, I, mean, I, mean, I wonder to what extent it's the fact that the woman, rightly or wrongly, is viewed as the manager of the household. So if a child is sick, it's assumed that the woman disrupts her day to take care of the sick kid or a little kid. And I wonder, even though this isn't that much time, the uncertainty about time in the workplace has overwhelming effects on employers' interest in paying and employing a woman. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, that's part of it. Uh, uh, and the problem is, of course, that when you... When for instance, have these maternity leave schemes, then, then women actually somehow confirms the gender stereotypes because we do take up childcare and all of that actually much more than we do in the US. So, so right. in a country like Denmark, where we have these uh, really general schemes and where it's women who take up the schemes, gender stereotypes are quite strong, much stronger than you would expect. Uh, we know that from, from uh, Eurostat, uh, which measures. Right. Right. Now and then. 
Okay, let me go on and, and switch to a slightly different, substantially different topic. It's topic number two in my mind. Uh, since you've spent time on corporate boards, what is your opinion on gender quotas on corporate boards? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have uh, in the sense, I, I don't think we can find empirical evidence that it harms the companies to have these quotas, but I don't think it works. Uh, I'm not, I'm quite skeptical um, because, I mean, Norway was the first country to introduce these quotas in 2008. In that year, all Norwegian listed companies had at least 40% women because as the law said that it would be closed down, even big companies. So, so they did. And then Mayanne Bertrand and uh, some colleagues made an evaluation 10 years after and found that actually the only impact, oh, now I say it in a tough way, but the biggest impact was that now there were 40% women on board, but it had had no trickle down effect on the Norwegian society. It had not changed the mind of young women. It had not impact, had impact on the gender wage gap or got more women into management positions and all that. And I think exactly what it is about, because, I mean, it's a bit symbolic policy in my mind. Sweden does not have a gender quota, um, and they have almost the same number of women or share of women in the, in the boards of the, the listed companies. I think what they have done is really wise in Sweden. Uh, I'm not always very uh, impressed by Sweden, but here I am because they have they were the first to introduce uh, that fathers to, to take part of the long parental leave that was in the mid-90s. And I think they have actually been able to, to uh, reduce gender stereotypes and help men and women to become more equal in the in housework activities and all that. Um, and I think that's a long run way of doing things if you want gender equality. Do you think the following, is it too cynical on my part to believe that all the push for things like gender quotas is really a way of helping those who are doing the pushing the already better off women who might get these positions anyway. I find a lot of this to be extremely self-serving. Is that too cynical or is there something no, to that? That's exactly my own uh, my own impression. Oh. And I have a little uh, evidence about it because since I have been a board member in Denmark, I've got so many offers from other Scandinavian countries, Norway and, and also other countries, because I'm a known person and, and I've got, uh, got these offers. But it doesn't have an effect down and helping all the broad group of very competent women nowadays to get positions. It favors a small group of women, I would say, uh, who get into these sports and earn a lot of money. But I mean, the idea should be they were role models and all that. But I don't think it works that way. The important thing I love, is. I love to hear this, Nina. I got into it, I was yelled at by two very well known female labor economists in the U.S. when I said exactly this, namely that it helps the better off, it doesn't help the average. And to me, the purpose should be to help the average, not to exactly. put more money and more prestige in the pocket of a few already very well off people. Yeah. Okay, let me go on. We said this doesn't work. We already agreed this doesn't work. What should governments do to make this disappear? To, at least to, to reduce the extent of gender of the gender wage gap and gender access to good employment. What's your what's your prescription, doctor? Yeah, it, this is quite difficult, honestly, because I mean we have legislation on equal pay, and there is equal pay to a large extent because you can because you can check that. The difficult thing is that this happens in the promotion process. Uh, and it's very difficult to make laws and regulation on promotion because you can easily escape that in practice for the companies unless you really, I mean, you can make quotas for board of directors and, and that's probably why they have done it because you can do it for board of directors, but you can't make a quota for the CEO or, or the C-suite members or I haven't seen any politicians daring to do that. And it is about promotion. And I think there are no ways to get equal opportunities here 
unless getting women to be as qualified as men in the sense that they have the same uh, time out of the labor force and almost, at least it cannot be extremely uh, gender biased how much women do in the household and all that. It has to be more equal. For me, that's the only way to do these things. And therefore, it's about publicly provided child care uh, of good quality and all these things. That's very important in my way uh, for, for equal opportunities. Uh, and then, of course, also, if you have long parental leave schemes, there should be a father quota. So the family only gets that long period if the father yeah. takes half of it or one third or whatever. Um, so we become more equal, men and women. That's a very good point. I hadn't thought, do any countries require that the husband or the, the father take at least a third of the total parental yeah. leave quota? Yes, Dan. Uh, they started in Sweden already in the 90s. Uh, it was not one third, it was a small amount, but now it has increased the share that fathers t take up. And for instance, Iceland, they make a fantastic leave uh, scheme around the year 2000, where one third for the mother, one third that the parents could share, and then one third only for the father. And if the father wouldn't take up, it was lost for the family. I think that's okay. quite easy. That's fantastic. Now, here's the question. I, has somebody studied the Iceland thing? I'd be very curious about the middle one third to the family. Does that all go to the mother or yeah. is it really 50 50? Yeah. Usually, parental leave goes mostly to the mother. That's how it of is course. because typically there are also economic reasons for that because the compensation is higher for the mother than for the father if there is a, a flat uh, or a maximum for, for the because then there are also large economic, the father usually earns more than the mother, and therefore he has a higher compensation rate. The problem with Iceland, I really wanted to do a study of Iceland in the early uh, zeros because this was such a good scheme. But then you had the Icelandic crisis where Iceland was close to go bankrupt, you know, in 2008. So it has been a bit difficult to see what happened. Um, a lot of women got into uh, CEO positions after that, but I think that was more because all these men had failed and made Iceland bankrupt. So, so I don't think it was because of the quota. <laughs> okay, let me finish up by asking for a forecast, okay? I want you to answer the question, in 2050, about 30 years from now, when my granddaughters are in their early 50s and your grandchildren are probably in their 40s or late 30s, okay? Will things be better? Will the gender pay gap be reduced? Will there be more equality in your view in household behavior, taking care of kids, et cetera? It's a forecast. I know, if I can't hold you, I won't be around to, to make sure you're correct. What do you think? No, no, we are probably dead at that time. So, yeah, I think it will be more equal. But the point is that it's going so slowly, the, the, the changes um, in most countries. But they will become more equal in the future. I'm absolutely sure. But the thing is that, I mean, we the, the problem is for, for all uh, OECD countries that we lose so much talent in all these years because we have made an enormous educational investment in women. So I'm, I mean, it should be a faster process in my view uh, because we, we lose so much talent and we can't afford that in, the, in our countries, but it will become better, I'm sure. I really like that argument. I mean, this is a classic economic argument against discrimination. Forget about fairness. The notion is it's a dead weight loss, as we economists say, to the economy. You're just throwing money away by not letting people and not encouraging people to work in their most useful activity, their highest productivity activity. And I think the point you just made, to me as an economist, not worrying about equity, the efficiency argument here seems really important. I don't think we make that often enough, I, I would argue. Yeah, I, for, as an economist, that's my main argument because uh, I mean the other thing is more political, and it is important. I mean, I mean, the, my own impression is that women are actually quite good, and do I also believe that diversity is a quite good thing in the sense that 
my boardrooms where I have seen, I've seen that that women may have, I have experienced it myself, may have different perspectives than men quite often. And it is quite important in the boardroom or in the C-suite to have different positions uh, that made that may very often make better decisions. Right, right. Nina, this has been a real pleasure. Uh, the delight seeing you again. I hope I can see you again in person sometime. I mean, someday we're all going to be able to travel more than we yeah. have been. And uh, it'd be great to see you. Thanks for being here with me. Thanks for asking me. Have a nice summer. Take care.